Cool. So yeah, I think these are the questions that, that the group has compiled, but I, I was thinking maybe we could just start with what we were talking about last week in terms of product market fit and how that journey was for you for the different startups that you worked on, because I think that's quite relevant to everyone. Sure. Do you have anything in particular you want me to cover there or just ruminate on this? Yeah, I guess just the different paths to product market fit, you mm-hmm. know, as Chad like last week for Hamlet, for Sendif and for Lens Advisor and just the lessons that you learned there and you, like what worked and what didn't work. Okay. Yeah, I can go through that. I could also give another anecdote as well. So I, I can start back in like 2011. I co-founded with my good friend, a company called Blockmate. And this is when, after we saw the rise of Instagram and Facebook uh, taking over and they sold for a billion dollars to Facebook, like amazing exit, right? And so we'd seen that happen over the past few years. We were like, you know what? We can start a social uh, startup. I think we can get this. Like we're smart enough. We can create something. We were in Boston at the time. And so we founded this company called Blockmate and we created this website where you, it was like hyper local interest groups. It's like meetup meets something even more intimate and it totally failed. Social startups are usually hugely difficult based to plan. And there's a bunch of startup ideas that are actually not that. And I think I've tried to start all of those, uh, at some point in my career, but in, in speaking to product market fit, I think we did all of the wrong things in that we barely validated the idea with any of our customer. We started building right away, just based upon what we thought we would like and that we thought our friends would like based upon our limited view of the world as well. So we were just trying to build something we thought that we would like, but even our friends, even though they loved us, they would barely even use the product once we had it out there. Fast forward some years later when I was building and I just saw this house that had six bedrooms in it. And I thought, Hey, we could probably rent out the other rooms and we could probably make a good profit margin on this. It was a gamble a little bit, but the market was validated. I was the customer, so it was really easy for me to see the need. I was trying to move around in Singapore and I could not find a good place to move to. I'd moved six times in one year and I'm like, I can't find a good short term accommodation, short term being medium term, something like one to three months, something along these lines. And I just thought, you know what? Other people need this too, because I must not be the only one suffering from this. And at the very least people rent long term. So we'll be able to fill the room, even if it doesn't. So we took a bit of a gamble and almost immediately the rooms were filled before we even rented the house. We had rented the rooms, um, and we were making 50% margin. So we rented the house for 6,000 a month. We were renting the rooms for 9,000 a month. So I got to take a room with my girlfriend at the time. And that was, it was a completely free room. And then we were making a few thousand dollars on top of that. And it was just like, this is crazy. And the nice thing about that was that it was so obviously repeatable. People need accommodation. It's something that is universal, right? You need to live somewhere. And do people need the type of thing that you're creating? Figuring out exactly what that offering was took time, but the need that people were facing was really apparent and already there. So it was really easy. It's like there, there's a lot of startup founders or a lot of startup like writers out there that talk about this idea that the, the customer is pulling the idea out of you rather than you forcing the idea uh, onto them. And that's really true. When you get product market fit, the customer's expectations are suddenly met by the product that you have created. And they're like, wow, finally someone has created something that's what I've always wanted and they will buy. And so with Hamlet, that was, it was a really easy value proposition because we knew people needed this type of accommodation. And so we just built for us and that happened to go out to everybody else. With Lens Advisor, it's also the same, wherein eyewear stores, opticians, they need a way to sell their products online but they don't have the technical prowess and know-how or money to build something, build a solution that allows for customer effectiveness. And so we built a plugin solution for that. It's a really niche market, but we, we now have 50 eyewear stores that use our product 
And we're processing like $3 million uh, per month of orders through the little niche product. And once we had released the initial version, it was so apparent that we had something that worked because all of the stores that we had talked to before signed up, or at least a portion of them did. And then they told us everything that was wrong with the product, but they didn't abandon it. They still paid us money. And then we just continued to build the product better and better to now we're, we're at the point that like all of the original stores signed up with us that we had uh, done customer interviews with at the beginning. And so that is just another example of meeting the customers where the need is, and they are telling you what they need. Um, once you fulfill the base need, like you meet all of the needs, even before you had to talk to them, uh, and they experienced your product, like it's Nirvana, like it perfectly matches what they need. Um, and this feels like amazing product market fit when it works. Then on the frustrating side, even now, uh, another startup that I'm uh, co-founding is called Sendif, and this is a email marketing, uh, app. Originally it was like AI, uh, AI generated emails for e-commerce. We validated this idea with a lot of customer interviews. Um, people told us they wanted it. They even said they would pay for it. And then somewhere along the line, our implementation has not met those expectations or those expectations weren't even real to begin with. It's like these expectations of everybody wants to have a vibrant friend group and go out on the weekends and play sports and have a better body. But then what are the products that match those expectations in such a way that they will pay you a lot of money for you to fill them with your product? And we missed the mark on sending. We're still relaunching it. We know it's a need of the customer to, to have a product that does the functions we're thinking about, but our implementation isn't working. Sometimes it takes a, a while to figure out how to get to product market fit. So that's been a recent frustrating uh, piece of my startup is how do I bridge this gap uh, and get to product market fit um, with a product I know the market needs and I know people are meeting this need out there. How do I build a better product that they will jump over and use my product instead? Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. I, I think uh, before we go on with these uh, questions, why, why don't we make it a bit more of a workshop if you guys want to perhaps just like asking us any questions or even if you want to workshop specific problems in relation to your startup on any topic at all feel free to ask yep Mark. okay so i face uh, the same problem you mentioned with sandy last year during a new product i was being on my company t tracker a tool that connects homes to private risk collectors in my country, I research in four, four regions in my country, and I validated the idea, first version, web version of the product. I presented it to some venture um, investors. So after I presented it to them, they, they, were, they were really happy to invest. I, I got scared because I did not have that experience of launching a product. But I think one thing I also, while building that first version, I had not implemented all the features done my customers really need. I started building everything back from scratch and this year we are going to look at face something similar to what you did. And so I guess, do you have a, I have some thoughts here, but do you have a particular question or problem that you want to think through? Okay. Yes. You mentioned, I think the main thing that you really spoke on was about the food of market food. And so like, I want to find out like, what was the base element? your most success, successful product that you have built, like what were the main parameters of working? So I'm asking like, um, what the main parameters of like, when you were considering your market here, yeah. how were you able to really implement like what your customers wanted, aligning to where you see the market, like where you could see the market in the future and, and compare it to what is currently happening. Sure. My main thought here is worrying about that or even trying to meet the market at that level is too premature. And what I mean by that is that there's only one need that you need to meet for a customer. And that's whatever use case that your product is going to serve. You only need to meet one. The rest of your product can be absolutely garbage. It doesn't work. It looks really bad. Nothing else matters except that your customer is able to get what they need by using your product. 
Now, it doesn't mean that all products are super easy to build and, or that use case is even easy to build for. Sometimes that use case takes years of research and, and product development, and then even regulation that you have to go through potentially in order to get just that use case to market. But I, I think it's important to think about some of the things that you've used in your life or even continue to use in your life today that don't meet your need very, like it's not pretty, it's not complete, but it meets your use case. It's like, kind of like driving a car that's really beat up, like the radio doesn't work, windows don't roll down, the AC doesn't work, but if it still gets you to the destination, it gets you that, right? Like all the other things are really nice to have. And it, if you have the money, you'll buy a nicer car. But the use case is, it gets you that. And so when you're building your product, I think for, if I take this back to what I'm working on now, which is like lens advisor, the use case is uh, eyewear stores need to be able to sell their products online. And without lens advisor, they can't do that easily. Like it's really hard. Uh, so they plug, if they plug in our product, they can do it. And they're, they're super happy that they can do this thing so easily. On the flip side, send it like they're able to meet their use cases with other things out there in the market already. And so we haven't identified that use case that makes it really compelling to use our product. We thought we had, we built that and it turns out that customers really didn't care that much about that use case. And so when you're building your product, I find a lot of red, what is it? Red herring, what is, what is the term? Where it's like, you're, you're, you can chase after one thing, you think it's totally going to work and you really work hard to meet this use case, but in actuality, like the customer doesn't really need that. It's not the real need of the customer. And so getting down to really what that, what the customer need is and what the customer wants is and what they'll really pay for, what they're actually trying to do is one of the hardest things to do. And really you can only do this if you, you have a you yourself are a passionate customer for what you need to get done, or you know some of your customers and you really understand what they need to do to get done. Or if you're really lucky, they've hired you already to just build that thing for them. And then you can extend that out and give it to others. I think a lot of the time, what we do as entrepreneurs is we think up these use cases that sound good in theory, and then we try to market our product and solution to people that don't actually have that problem. We just think they do. And it's because we don't intimately understand their problem well enough. So I, I would encourage you to think through this with your product and understand like that one thing that your customers are trying to get done and, and how you meet it. And all the rest doesn't really matter. You're talking about building product and getting back into the development and, and whatnot. And you have a whole bunch of features that you need to create. My guess is that most of those features don't matter at all to your customer as in they matter like power window or a rolling window matters like the rolling the the power window on the car is nicer but it it doesn't actually matter that much so if you can identify the one thing they really need to get done they'll start to ask you that they'll use it to get the thing done and they'll be like ah oh, i really wish it did this. and you'll make it better and better based upon that and at the end, you'll have a beautiful luxury car that they can, that they love. But at the beginning, it just needs to be fun. Yep. Good. Good. All right. Hi. So this is almost in sync with the first question on the screen, but so you mentioned that we needed to find a product market fit, right? Like we had to figure out the one thing that they need and figure out how it perfectly works for them. But when your product is imperfect and you don't have a lot of capital to spend, how do you find your first few people? How, how do you find people you can sell an imperfect product to and who would be willing to even help you make it perfect? They have virtually no reason to help you do that, right? They don't need to give you feedback. They could very easily choose another product. So how do you find these first few customers who would be okay with even giving input to make your product better? Amara, if you want to provide like just um, like a high level of like your, your particular product and, and business and um, perhaps here we can help you brainstorm in your specific case as well as in your general case. So we run an ed tech startup. Our first product, the one that is soon going to go live is an ERP tool for schools. So we worked exclusively B2B on that one. We did significant. What is ARP? 
and the enterprise resource yeah, platform. Yeah, oh, so I, okay, sorry. So that was, we did a lot of user research on it. We were very much part of the education industry for the last 12 years. So we had significant input as to what to build, right? But we are going against people who have been in the same business for say 15 years, right? And even though you can point out imperfections in their product that we do better, there needs to be someone who is willing to take the imperfections in ours too and uh, get us to the next point. So how do we tackle that? This is a, a, it's a good question. And I think it comes down to how, if we distill it, like, how do I find the customers that I can sell to? Re really, you're, I think at the beginning, you said, like, how do I find the people that, that care about this, with this imperfect product? Is that right? And I say that right? Okay. I would say there's a couple different solutions here. The unsexy, unfun one is that it comes down to like large numbers. And the, maybe an easy way to think about this, I'm making these up on the fly, so tell me if they're horrible analogies, it, is that if you're selling t-shirts, the, the person that really wants to buy your t-shirt is the person that it doesn't have a t-shirt on right now and doesn't have access to any. So it's like, you, you could try to sell this t-shirt to like a hundred people and they'll be like, no, I, I have a shirt. I don't need anything. But like, there's someone out there that really need a t-shirt and they will find the t-shirt, right? They're going to search for it and eventually find it. So you have to find the customers that are in the need for that thing at the moment, because eventually they'll solve that solution. And to find that person, unfortunately, it's not so easy as like looking at a crowd and finding the person that's not wearing the t-shirt, it's you, you have to go out and advertise this product somehow, some way. So you can do this through, of course, like Google ads, you can do this through social media marketing. You can do this through referrals. There's lots of different strategies to, to bring, get people inbound, but it's something that you, it's probably the most important lesson that I ever had to learn as a startup founder is that getting my product in front of a lot of people having a lot of interviews with customers, as many as I possibly can, while it's so painful to do as an introvert and so out of my comfort zone, it's the only way that you can actually get to the person that needs the product that you're building and then work with them. They will then tell you and be like, oh, this isn't a great product for these reasons and, and build the right thing. But if you can't identify the one person that will use your product and that you're meeting that use case for, and that will then is also willing to pay you for it and then use it, right? Then it becomes really difficult because you'll never get up the product development. You'll keep building the product. You'll keep improving it. You know what you needed at that time, because you said you were also in the education industry for a long time, right? But you're not doing that work now or you're, or you've started the startup and now you're working in the startup. Is that right? Oh, uh, we're part-time uni students still. Okay. Okay. Yes. The engines of the business was like, I used to freelance a lot, right? And I was building yeah. all B2B for uh, other startups, schools, universities. So that's how yeah. I got the idea. But the thing is, even though we outperform all the my other products in the market, we want, as you mentioned, we want that one, like the one product that they really need that solves rather than having windows that go up by themselves. So, so sometimes. It, that's not even possible, depending on the market that you're attacking. If the, there's ready solutions already in the market for what you guys are doing, then you have to search for the customers that are trying to solve that problem in the moment. And you need to meet them in that moment. If you're like, it's really hard to pull people out of the existing product, those existing solutions that they're using, uh, until they're like ready to make that switch. Or you have something that is so incredible and so obviously better that naturally people will move forward. And my guess is that the product you've built is probably not 10 X better today. Maybe it is in very small aspect, but overall, like yeah. it doesn't 10 X yeah. better meet the needs of, of the person, which means you have to attack it for like kind of brute strength, most yeah. likely, which is get as many inbound leads as you can advertise as much as you can find the people in the moment when they need that product and you provide the solution, your solution is better. And so they're not going to move away. So your attrition will be less, but it, it means that you still have to get out there and sell, 
which it can be really hard. The ideal scenario is always like you build something that's so good that people just come. But the reality is that's so rare that it almost never happens and is really about struggling through that, building a good enough product and then selling it. And the selling portion part is a hard thing for a lot of entrepreneurs to get through, but it's one of the most important lessons you learn, in my opinion. Cool. Does anyone else want to workshop any problems or should we go to the remaining questions on the AMF tree? I think we can start with the sheet where you have questions along the way. Okay. So. The first one, how did you manage to find and get your first hundred customers? I know you've been talking about the same on the same boundaries, but if you could give specific examples from Hamlet, let's say both for landlords and guests, how did you convince them to list their properties with you, book test days with you? And where do yeah. these customers? Sure. On the landlord side, we knew there would be a lot of hesitation about allowing us to manage our properties. So we just didn't tell them. We knew this might come back and bite them. But we also knew that we had to get started. And so we, once we had done a few and they were working, then we were able to start giving some stories about how the existing properties were working, how we took better care of our property than if it was just some random, some, yeah, a random person renting the flat. So we, we were able to craft the narrative over time to convince the landlord to come on board. But yeah, we, we knew this would be difficult at, at first and we just found a way around it. Um, we got rejected from quite a few properties and we'd be like, yeah, we're going to sublet. And they're like, no, I should be getting that money. Of course I wouldn't sublet it to you. So we had to break through some of those barriers with the landlords. Then uh, on the customer side, I think we had a pretty good intuition on our customers needed. I did because I, I'd been living this life for the past six years. And so I knew that people wanted a really nice place to live and they wanted to live with cool people. Uh, and like, how do you define cool? That became something that we could work on over time. But in reality, we just did interviews with everybody that was coming in and made sure that they would fit together in the flat. And, and in order to find the first hundred customers for Hamlet, it, it was easy because there's already a marketplace or a, a ready demand out there in the market. And I, and I think that's true of most of the startups that we're creating. We can see that there's demand in the market. But for, for Hamlet, it's apparent because there's a certain number of expats that are moving to Singapore every single year. They all need to find housing. There's interns, there's students, there's um, people being relocated. And we, we could see that they were all struggling. And this is anecdotally within our friend circles. We're like, where are you living? People banding together, li living together, but then needing to find roommates, et cetera. So we just knew that these customers were out there. Once we put together the properties, we were able to work with them. And the same way, I think that we were just talking like uh, Amara, where you have to get out there and put your product in front of the customers. Like we didn't just put together a house and wait for people to come. No one's going to find us. So we listed on every single advertising form that was available. Eventually we were able to narrow it down. We knew the best performing one. And so we listed, we started listing on only of them, but we, every single room that came available, we would list it on all of those. We take the inbound lead, we consolidate them, we arrange the viewings, do the showings. And then when, once the customer was in front of us, then we could sell them on the idea of living with cool people. This is a different type of flat. Here's the people that are living here. Here's why they're interested to live with. And we'd have this breakdown of who they were. And most people would want, by the end of this like little sales cycle that we had developed, most people were like just ready to move in. And if they weren't the right fit, we just wouldn't take them through that sales cycle. So getting the first 100 customers wasn't too hard per se, but we still had to go through all of the motions. Like we, we built a product and we still had to get out there um, and, and list it and put it out. But we spent a lot of time crafting, taking the images, crafting the listings of, uh, about the property, uh, you know, all, all of this stuff, having a, a database of who was living in the house. So we would have their pictures. This is before Airtable exists, existed. So we built a website that was run off of the Google Sheets, basically, and with pictures of all of the flatmates. So I could open up every single flat that we had and show them the people that were living there, what industry they were working in, what type of person they were, like, about them. 
and it just became really easy to. So that that's how we we got our first hundred customers, and then VR. Okay, I think I answered the questions here. Yeah, yep, that definitely does answer the question. Moving on to the next one. Who did you hire for your first 10 employees Hamlet? What were the roles and why specifically those roles? Got it. For Hamlet specifically, it's a very operationally intense purpose. So the, the first person I hired, so we had the two co-founders. One was good with sales. I was good with operation. And so uh, I did operations and sales. So I would sell the unit and then I would deal with all of the, anything that happened in the unit as well. So specifically, we wanted to hire our first employees that would take over these key functions, right? So operations and sales for us were the most important, and that's who we hired first. Then as we started to grow, we hired a real estate agent, um, someone that could go out and find the property. And we took every spec that we were doing ourselves as co-founders and the, the ones that we could systematize easily. And, and that we're taking us a lot of time, like and specifically in manual time, um, we would try to hire that role out as soon as we could. But at the beginning there, this wasn't possible to do it also. Like we just did everything ourselves, right? So it was the team of two, then a team of three, then a team of four. But the, the main functions were operations to start, then sales, then investment to get the properties coming in. Then we scaled operations and sales more with more people on that staff. We had some technology development, but I, I was the tech lead. So I did everything myself at that time. Then we brought on a early employee in and he was also able to run operations and sell. And so mainly we focused on the key areas that drove revenue in our business, especially at the beginning, and then also took the most amount of time on our side. And, and only when we had surpassed probably 15 employees, did we start to think about auxiliary roles. This is like HR or things like social media presence, stuff like that. Things that didn't directly impact the bottom line, but grew the brand So the design team, for instance, gave us the look and feel. Those only happened after we had really nailed down our operational efficiency and being able to just get the job done. All right. So I think the next question is an extension to the current one, which is mm -hmm. we noticed that at your current companies, Lens Advisor and Zendesh. Your team's yeah. pretty small with just you and your co-founder. So when do you decide to hire more people? Why have you not decided to do that yet in comparison to how? Sure. I think, so I, I can give you a little bit of color on Lens Advisor is that we only, have, so me and my co-founder, we found a really great agency. I, I interviewed probably 30, 40 different, like either indivi individual developers or agencies. And I found one developer in particular under an agency that was really good. And so we engaged that. So it's not exactly true that we don't have a single employee in, in Lens Advisor. So we started out with one developer. So me and him were putting together the code base. And as we grew it, we didn't hire a single person for probably two years in Lens Advisor. And that's more a function of how quickly we're growing and the revenue that's coming in than anything else. I wanted to build a company not based upon VC funding where we have to burn through capital in order to get to a revenue base, but I wanted to build something profitable. And so that was my focus at Lens Advisor. So we grew small, but we're, we're, we're now expanding a bit. So we, we now have two developers full-time and three support staff. And that's mo mainly because those are the things that started taking me too much time. At, at the very beginning, you want to be really close to customers. And even as you grow, you still want to be close to customers. At some point you have so many customers that like a uh, founder can't take care of all the customers or it becomes too cumbersome because you're not able to perform the role in the way that that's a business need. And just in fact, my headphones are dying. So I'm going to take one out. And so what I mean here is there, there were a lot of things that I needed to do for lens advisor. Like I, need, I needed to have a meeting with, uh, potential customer or potential partner. I needed to go to a dev workshop. I needed to attend a Shopify event so I could meet some of the people there and work through some problems. And then customers were pinging me all the time. And so I was constantly on my phone during a 10 minute break. I would try to answer customers and tell them, okay, I'll be, I'll get to you in an hour. And sometimes they're not being able to. So that only when it became so overwhelming, did I move to hiring people to take over that role. But those initial 
interactions with customers and potential customers are what allowed me to see what the market needed. So we still do not have a PM. No one is doing product work except myself at Lens Advisor because I still talk to, I don't know, I don't know how many customers I talk to every month. It's a lot. Um, I talk to at least like a few every single day, just on, on chats. Um, every week I'm doing at least probably five, just face to face or video going over the product, what they need, how I can implement it. Um, and so that allows me to see really clearly what the market needs. Like without those, I wouldn't be able to envision what the future of lens advisor would be, but finally. It's so overwhelming that I had to hire three customer support staff so I could do 24 seven customer support and at least chat support. And that's how I, all startups go in, in some way or another, where it just gets overwhelming for the founder to be able to handle the, the amount of work that's coming in. And you better hope that you're charging enough for your profitable because then you actually have someone to fulfill the roles that you need. But yeah, now at Lens Advisor, we're, we're seven people technically. And then for Sendif, we have, we also have a development staff of two that, that we have on board, but also through that same agent. All right. So I guess you answered a bit of this question in your current explanation, but how your thought process shifted from starting Hamlet to starting your current companies? I don't think my thought process has, thought, has shifted too much. I think with my first few companies that I had built and failed. I was building the wrong product and I wasn't, I should, I say building the wrong product, but in reality, I just wasn't close enough to the customer. So even now, the, the main thing for me is to really deeply understand the customer problem so that I can do something about it. And that's the driving force behind pretty much everything that I do. If I understand what they need, I can sell it to them and they'll give me money to solve it. So almost everything I do is focused on that. Did that answer the question then? Yeah, I guess a little bit. If you add up the bit, do you said about how you wanted to build lens and why on a profit basis without waste money, if you add sure. it, it makes sense. Sure. Okay. Yeah. This are just to scale, right? So when, when you have product market fit, you then at that point can choose if, if you bootstrapped up to that point, you re and somehow you've gotten to profitability and you have some product market fit. Then you can choose to go all the way VC or go all the way bootstrap. VC is going to accelerate your business like immeasurably, but it comes with a lot of problems that I didn't know that I would face when I first started Hamlet uh, or when we first raised money with Hamlet. It was a huge learning journey to understand what it was to grow quickly. And I think that's probably a completely different kind of like topic of that would probably just take a long time anyway. And maybe we'll get, we'll be able to take some time into that. But, uh, the, the main focus for me for not wanting to, to yet take VC money is that I don't think I could use the capital efficiently enough. And like with lens advisor, I can see how it can grow, but I know that if I take that capital, I don't know if I can get it to where, if I can truly grow it in the way that I think, because it's all anecdotal ideas. Like I, I haven't proven those ideas yet and I can't quite, I can see how it could scale, but I'm not a hundred percent sure that what the customer would be. Hamlet was a different story with Hamlet. I could see that the product was working and our limitation was we couldn't build the properties quickly enough. So at that point it became somewhat obvious. If we take the money, we can literally just apply it to what we are doing already. Just reproduce it over. Um, I don't quite have that lens advisor. And so I know I have to navigate a more difficult path with lens advisor. If I'm going to grow it to a hundred million dollar company, because there isn't yet a clear repeatable path to getting like tens of thousands of optical stores, uh, on board to the platform because they actually don't make that. So, so this is my limiting factor, right? Then with Sendif, it, it was more obvious that we needed to move back. And so that's why the, there's another aspect to taking money, which is that competition is coming or you need to attack an idea or there's a zeitgeist in the moment. And at that point, it might be really useful to jumpstart or kickstart or to have enough capital in order to apply to a problem, to get it to product market fit even faster, and then be able to reproduce it and have a team behind it. So there, there's a lot of reasons you might 
approach it differently. But I think the core, my core focus to building startups, that's always been true is that you find a problem that people are having or a need or something, and you just try to solve it and solve it in the best possible way that you can and, and create a product that you're going to be really proud of and that people want to use. Easier said than done in a lot of cases, but yeah, it, it really just comes. My philosophy is still pretty much the same. Build something that people want. I, I think you're going to hear that like from Y Combinator and Paul Graham and stuff like that, but it's really true. There's a lot of joy in building something that people want to pay you money for. It's a, it's such a virtuous cycle. I hope you're all building towards that and get to it. Right. Thanks for that answer, Zinas. I know you mentioned that your co-founder and you had complementary skill sets, and I believe that's one of the core, you know, deciding factors on picking a co-founder, but what would mm -hmm. be some general advice that you could give to people on how should they look for a co-founder and how important it is to have one? There's a lot of material out there about searching for co-founders. I, I think that my, so only some of my advice is going to be applicable. It comes to like your current age, what you need in the business, the type of person that you are. For, for myself, I think it's really helpful for me to have a co-founder and it's mostly around moral support. It, it's like on the days that I feel my worst, I have someone that I can talk to that understand what I'm going through. That isn't my wife, right? So someone that's sharing in the journey with me uh, and just like really understands it, it is really helpful. And also sometimes when I just, like when I fail and, and I don't have the willpower to get something done or I need a break or someone that can step in and be like, yo, okay, I'll, I'll take 80% this week. You do 20%, don't worry about it. And when I've worked on solo project, I would feel so guilty when I would drop the ball, for instance, or I, I would have a lot of self-doubt, self-shame around that I wasn't doing it, for instance. But with a co-founder, you have a lot of back and forth. You have a reason to get up in the morning and go because someone's going to check in on you, even if they're the, like the nicest person, you don't want to let them. So there, there's a dynamic in working with a partner that can be really helpful. Some people don't need that, is, especially if you're able to fire an early team. Like those people can be almost your co-founder, maybe not in some of the psychological aspects or the support aspect, but if you hire like a really good founding team, like if you have enough capital, then maybe you don't need a co-founder at the beginning, but going through the hard times is really lonely alone. Uh, so having a co-founder to go through the hard times with can get you through the hard time is my experience. I think it's extremely helpful to have. Then, okay, that aside, then you have complementary skill set. Super helpful if your co-founder is not exactly like you. Like if one of you is technical and one has sales. Awesome. That's like the quintessential typical co-founder relationship, right? One is the extrovert, can do partnerships, can really sell the dream, the vision, what you're trying to build and, and the other person can actually build and implement and do the operations on what needs to get done and build the product. Really helpful if you have both aspects, because if you're a solo founder, you have to do both. Like you, there's no way around it. You can be the PM and you can hire a really good technical team, but then you still need someone that can get the customer insights, understand the customer, and then sell to the future customers, build the partnerships. You need someone that can get your product in front of the, the potential customers. Otherwise the product goes nowhere, no matter how good it is, you are probably just not one of the very few products that it like naturally comes about and people find out about it and it blows up, right? It's just probably not going to happen. And that was one of the hardest lessons I had to realize as an entrepreneur was if I'm building the product, people don't care. People don't care that I'm building the product until I can show them that it is going to solve their problem or that it, that they, their life will be better with my product. And what does that require? It requires a certain amount of charisma or a certain amount of enthusiasm, but at the very least it, it requires that I put it in front of them and show them what it does or what it is. And so you have to be able to do that aspect no matter what. All right. Then a lot of sense to me personally. So I think this is the last question. The other one was answered already, but we noticed right. that you've started a couple of different startups in different industries. 
Exactly. When picking these out, I know that you shared uh, about Amlet being a personal problem to you and that you would be a customer for your own product. But yeah. were all of these startups that you decided to start inspired from personal problems or were some of them fashion, fashion dependent or just a market type? Sure. So I'll say the ones that I failed easily are the ones I didn't have any personal passion around. So I also think that one of the most important skills you can develop in your entrepreneur journey is tenacity and the ability to continue on, even in the face of like unfair, overwhelming odds that you don't think are even possible to overcome. And the only people that tend to overcome these is someone that just wants to see the work done or wants to create something that solves the problem. So usually that means that you experience the problem yourself because only you would be willing to go through all the stupid things that it takes to solve that problem and to create something that's all. So I'll say the ones that failed more easily for me, like the music sharing, Beluga Beats, social networking, Blockmate, um, another social tool called Opscot. Like all of these failed because I, not because they were horrible products, but because I didn't have enough skin in the game where I wasn't passionate enough about solving the problem myself. And we didn't find the early users that would give us that. Passion. So I, th I think the passion can come from two different ways. One is you solve a problem for a group of people that are really happy that you're solving this problem for them. And the other is you're solving a problem for yourself. And then you're also giving that problem or giving that solution to other people. And they similarly feel it, it solves this thing for them. And that gives you enough energy to just keep going and keep building. So the ones that succeeded for me are the ones where I just had an unreasonable amount of conviction that solve, like building a product in this area and solving it in a good way would meet the needs and people would pay me money for it. So for Hamlet, that was pretty easy because I could see the problem. We solved it once people used it. They gave me money. I'm like, this is great. Like I'm solving something that someone needs. Similarly for lens advisor, this is a problem my co-founder faces because he runs rocket eyewear, which is Singapore's uh, largest online sunglasses brand. And during COVID he needed a way to sell his eyewear online but he couldn't find any way to sell it in a good way. There were no tools out there that would provide a checkout flow that he could use and then get his customers to buy with the prescription lens limit. And so when he presented me with this problem, he said, yo, I really need this. I had just left Hamlet at that point in time. And I was like, yeah, okay, we can come together on this and I'll help build it. And if we're building it for you, we'll build it for other people like you. And then we'll see what happens. Sure enough, they also needed it. But even if I just solved it for one person, which is my best friend, that still would have been a success. And we would have built it and built this product just for him. No one else would have picked it up, but we would have still had that one customer. And that gives us enough willpower to build it through the point where it really becomes performant and it really becomes like worthwhile, right? Because up until that point, there's like this tipping point of product market fit where if you stop like even one inch before that, you never start the, if you imagine it's like a, a hill that you have a mountain that you're pushing something up and then it starts rolling down the other side. But if you stop just one inch before the top, it rolls back down and never becomes a product. It never becomes a company. It never becomes a, a multi-billion dollar idea. But once you tip it over and people start picking it up, and they use it and they pay for it, it becomes like beautifully easy and continue working on that because you're building something that people need. And so there is this thing that you need to get over. And for some things, you just don't have the personal passion to push it over the edge. And a lot of times that just requires, it requires you just going all the way, having irrational beliefs that you're going to be able to build something that works in this area. Hope that yeah, answers that question a little bit. But feel free to ask me another question, please. All right. So maybe, so you, you spoke about how uh, successful businesses that you worked on came out from passion, required a lot of passion and some person's skin problem in the game for you to solve. 
by how much in bottles? Uh, what is she? Sorry, we got we got three minutes left with Zena, sir. Oh, maybe anyone else on the group has a sec. Let I don't know you guys' time, but I have a little bit more time. But yeah, please, yeah, just let me know. Yep. Hey, I think we'll stay on schedule because we okay. Like, uh, we we got like a group forum thing. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to take up too much of your night either. So, hey, cool. Uh, did anyone else have questions for Xenos in the last couple of minutes? Then I'll just answer the validate we'll, idea we'll in two minutes. So the, the, the easy way to validate, and I'll say this just again, is just go in front of as many customers as you can, um, with the idea. Like with Hamlet, we talked to many people before we ever even rented the house. I know I talked about like we rented it and we sold it and people bought it and we immediately had 50% occupant. But we had talked to all of our friends and I talked to many of my friends before we took that leap. And the same with Lens Advisor, we took screenshots of other applications or other websites that were doing similar things. And we put that together in a mock-up deck, put together, literally this is just like wireframing it. And I talked to 50 other, 50 people in the eyewear space that were selling online. And I said, if I build this, will you pay me $20 a month? They all said yes. Right. So validating it is just really just talking to as many customers as you can as quickly as possible. Yep. Funny. So sorry, I've been trying to raise my hand for a while, but uh, I had one question. Firstly, there's some sort of with the risk or the idea, but uh, how did your Sequoia Capital plan go? And if you could just explain in like small way how did you think them out, it would really Sure. So the, the easy answer is just like getting your customers is how you get your VCs. We had a hundred plus meetings with VCs, potential investors before we got our first investment for our seed round, which was not Sequoia, but we messaged Sequoia before our seed round. And when we, it came time for series A, they regretted that they had not talked to us, you know, because then we had some momentum behind us. but really it just came down to like. Just like with sales and finding your customer in the sea of people that need your product, you, you need to be able to do the same thing with VCs and raising capital is you need to be able to talk to a lot of people and get a lot of rejection. It's not, it's yeah, none of this is like sexy, easy things. It's mostly it's about presenting your idea to as many people as possible, as often as possible, uh, until you find the, the people that you resonate with. And that's true of VCs as well. We can get quite deep into why that is the case with VCs and raising capital, but probably a time for a different uh, discussion. All right. Yeah. Th thanks so much, man. I re really appreciate your time. My pleasure. It's the first one of the, that I've done. So I didn't know what the format or questions would be like. This, this has been really great. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, it's still evolving a bit. No, re really appreciate the advice. Man. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Reach out anytime. Sweet. All right. All right. All right. All right. Take care, guys. Bye. Cool. We'll probably go to like group sharing. So I'll leave it to you guys. Or if you guys got something out of the session with Xenos. Cool. Yeah. I'll hand it back over to you guys. I, I might drop as well, sir. Thanks so much, Rob. What do you guys think? Good chat. Bad. Got takeaways, not takeaways. It was good. It actually felt the problems and the points that he specifically put out felt very personal, having a problem that relates to your own life and having something like the thing you're working towards being something that you would want, that was a good perspective to gain. Yeah. It's just like, how much do you value education and experience in that certain problem space before you start solving by dreaming of the network? Right. But overall, like. Not just for my sake, but do you think this format works where we are a guest lecture to talk to you, you have your questions answered, um, you get to know how they did what they did. So is this valuable? Yeah, well, I'll read the last part of this. I read my half of this, but I did want to say that I, and I think the format is really great. Uh, maybe it could improve. I know I joined you, uh, maybe if we could. Five. A little bit more five. would be greater than the other question. Mm -hmm. But it was an amazing call. The session can also be called like the use of the project. Uh, one thing works to Okay, all right. So 
uh, all of what you said, but I'll try to bullet it out. Good session, found value out of it. You want it to be longer, but that longer needs to depend on how much time guest speaker has to pre-pitch them a two-hour call every time. What we get enough time for everybody's questions to be answered, but most probably these guys will end up giving us that can hire a week. So we try to make it longer, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I have requests, even if they like don't have a lot of time, right? I think these questions would be pretty generic. No matter who we ask, we're going to ask the same questions, right? How do you validate it? How do you get your first hundred customers? Or why did you choose this particular idea? And I think, I think most of them would have answered this somewhere, right? If some application or one of those things. So maybe they could just give us those answers before the session. And during the session, we could pitch our idea to them and they can tell us what mistakes they think is there. Because I'm assuming every entrepreneur you in, invite to the to like with us here, would have gone through multiple different thoughts of ideas and why they shot down their own ideas or multiple different iterations of things. And so it would really help if they could help because the way we resonate with them when they talk about their own thing, I'm sure it would work the other way around too. So maybe that's something you could consider where like we can go like taking five minutes each and pitching our idea and they can go through it. Like even if they're not familiar with the industry. Yep, definitely. That's what Rob expected out of you yesterday, right? Where he asked you to explain what your company is doing and how you can ask a very specific question about how to take something forward. In your case, I think it's for whole one. So it's for you to share, I mean, which is why for the last entire week, I've been asking you guys if you want to share questions, share them beforehand. I also shared a bunch of resources for you guys to read. Not sure how many of you guys went through that, but. If you give me your questions beforehand, we could also get those written out directly from the guest lecturer before and we don't even have to go through them. So the entire one hour would just be talking about you guys and your businesses. Um, but that engagement needs to come from you, not from us. Also, one more thing. Have you guys heard of Build Space? Yes, we have. We have the, okay. in the so same cohort, we have, I think, two people will be joining from Build Space. We're both Space. doing Build Space. Uh, yeah. If anyone here wants to go, we have invites we can share. So, yeah. yeah. It's just funny. So thoughts on Build Space, they're also trying to do something similar, I think. What do you guys think? Look at what they're providing and what's different from us. But you found a lot of people who want to come over and they want to be interested. My guess right now is just that a lot of these entrepreneurs like would like to probably apply for every opportunity you get in such a space and that's the same kind of feedback I'm getting from all the people we talk just to give you some perspective I have 189 people who have scheduled a meeting with me this week so talking to all of them I'm getting a lot of common feedback from multiple people so yeah I think build space is a good thing but always uh, you all always said, take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, we are, for the one spawn, I think that is good. We are all in 500 more that are wrong. All of these programs at the end of the day will rely on how much effort you But yeah. the best we can do from our side is try to help you on that journey in like different ways. So connecting you with people who've done it before, connecting you with people who are in similar stages. You provide whatever resources we are consuming to do as well. So whatever you want our goals post to basically how are we proceeding with building our company and how you can take it forward from there. Now the perks here are you're getting different views from people in the same company. Right? So you see different aspects. Like I think Dinos mentioned something with the couple of things like how he hired into that AI. So if you look at it, all of from Rob to Joseph to Sidon. We all have our specific goals for the week, where we want to grow the company and how we want to take it from. And I think if you if you guys narrow it down to that and have a more focused approach to it, it should work. Either the program itself does not matter. So you want to follow the YPO structure and the YPO structure is most, mostly common thing with themselves and bringing in that peer group effect. That's the same thing we're trying to create here. And um, uh, I also went through a lot of other courses, like similar to Build Space and stuff. But I mean, at the end of the day, you don't 
maybe Meta or other social media ads to just target your specific kind of industry and the people that you think are your potential customers and yeah, have them book a meeting with you. One thing that we at Contact Heart have noticed is if you do some kind of incentive, it could be maybe some credits to your platform. It could be a little bit of money. It could be like 100 rupees, 500 rupees or something. They'd be more likely to book a call with you. So a little bit of investment that you make, but uh, that would definitely lead to better and better leads. Um, another thing that Rishi obviously shared was email campaigns and uh, try to see if networking events help as well. And uh, yeah, uh, definitely, I think reaching out to industry groups or industry sales and recruitment. So I think all of us, all of the product posts here have already joined some communities, some Facebook groups, industry groups in the forums that we definitely connect with and keep that fit our user own right them to our cause as well. So yeah, that definitely helps bring from many more different avenues with these samples called your yeah, interviews. Thank you. Guys, you got anything? Bana, Gush. I always get confused as to what call. Should I call you Amara or should I call you Adhika? Almost everyone calls me Amara. Either way, it's on a place. Yeah. All right, fine. Okay. I'll call you Amara as well. All right, you guys got anything? Any okay, channel yeah. that you'd like to okay. share? Service do you guys use? Like at contact out the at contact out domain, right? So which Gmail provider do you use? We have Gmail. Gmail, okay. Do you want to see? It's expensive. It's being expensive. Yeah. We need, like, right now, all I have is I have a receiving end, right? Any email that comes, my server points it to my Gmail inbox, but I can't send out email. And it's going to get pricey, and we're running out of money at the firm. Uh, do you guys know any alternatives? I know you guys use Gmail, but would you be aware of any alternatives in that? Uh, have you tried contact out yet? Let's find out <laughs> how expensive is contact out. Okay. So. This is what happens when you don't explore codes. Contact Out has a freemium plan where we give you unlimited access to sending emails. All you need is your email account. So your personal Gmail account, you can connect it and use it for mass outreach. There's no charges required. You bring in your own data, you can do campaigns and run your email outreach. So where's the money? What's the premium part of the premium? So our premium part is the extensive data that we bring. Uh, as long as you bring in your data, we're not charging you. If you want to find more people, uh, that's what we think. Okay, so is that an addition to that question or does it end there? Sarin, I know you're traveling, but would you like to share something as well? Sure. So I think a lot of my stuff is for everything like my arm. I'm hoping that so I'm on a travel and I'm hoping that you would be identify some problems that I could get my job paid in deep with from that traveling in fact a little lot so something that I could potentially work on that is actually a real problem but actually other than something that I was planning on working on I just haven't find an edge on it hoping that my idea can fail on the other hand, something that I am constantly watching on for I know this is not like that if you like your business but I okay then Am I only the one who's missing out the audio or that? So again, I got a lot of bullet points. I forgot for me just of it. She said she could not find out, and she's not figuring out an idea, but she wants that to be something neat. She said thank you for something. We'll wait for her to come back. But yeah, the, how we talk about it as the problem space is infinite. There, for any solution you might have, there would be 10 people who will come and be like, Hey, this could have been added. So there is no end to finding problems. Just got to take your time out and settle in on one. All right. Any learnings that you guys would like to share apart from your challenges? What new you drew last week, if anything, or just some reinforcement on existing knowledge? Yeah. For me, last week, I, I started uh, going through some white computer process and you were really uh, important things. I got serious, like you need this strategy to um, I can find a good computer, maybe why computer platform that I was able to evaluate their, their business model. Mm -hmm. and you remember everything that I saw, like how I could come up with new coins from new um, features on the platform. That's right. That is because that is this company of 
I've really been trying to validate and find who my respiratory company is. This is going to be a place like Africa. It hasn't been tested in media parts of the world. So, actually, God, um, company and welcome to the world. We are in fun. I encourage maybe other students to so go and check uh, the Y Combinator. They have some music based to it. So, this person that you found from Y Combinator, did you get to them via the, on the program from YC or? Did you reach out to them individually somewhere else? Not yet. Sorry. I thought you just mentioned that you found someone who reinforced your oh. idea. A company on the Y community. I don't know if we reached out to the founders yet. Right. So you're waiting for your if you're waiting on hearing back from them. Right? All right. That's pretty really interesting. The YC school stuff, I went over it as well. It's got some resources to it. What about you guys? Got any new learnings? I told Sahana to share this, but she's not, she's not talking, so I'm just going it, to... It, more than learning, this is a success story. Like, we just posted a reel recently, our first social media post, right? And it hit 10k, 10k views, and we, we have never posted anything before, and it was a completely brand new account. But yeah. It's all her, her voice, she edited all. She's, uh, I asked her to send in the WhatsApp group. Yeah, you do share it with all of us. We'd like to see what content you're making as well. But that's amazing. So is this a new Instagram page uh, for your company or? We yeah. just started the Instagram page. Like we had the page for a bit, but like we, I think we finally figured out exactly what we want to do with the page itself, who we're targeting, what kind of content we want to put out and how people are putting it out, things like that. I think we finally managed to figure that out. So that first official poll. You what planning on all of this yourself or are you? No. Are you getting mm-hmm. someone to do it? I do have a team, but I am a micromanager, which is yep. why the entire the first reel is entirely done by me. This is something they can go off of. Because I'll explain how this a, goes. Oh, no. Right? So if she'll, I'll tell her, don't do it yourself, delegate it. She delegates it. They do something and she'll be like, yeah, no, this is not good. I'm going to do it myself. And she does it all herself. But I do it at the end, it's done. It, that's what matters. Yeah, it's very fair. If you take a look at the work that, you know, others have sent us and what she does, it you know, light in there, but all for the motivation, right? She is more inclined to do something good than they are. So, yeah. Hey, that's pretty interesting. But from personal experience, I'd say that could get you pretty busy pretty quickly because you'd end up just doing all the work yourself. Uh, yes, with dealing with the team, right? We aren't doing paid internships right now. Like we're not putting any capital into the paying people. So we have a bunch of unpaid students with us and they are plenty talented. Like we had recruitment group interviews and everything, but it's the time, right? If I'm able to do something in five minutes and it takes them an hour, I am more inclined to do it myself. That is true. Like she is much faster than they are and like much better. And that puts like this big resistance. It just give it and not think about it. That is so difficult for me to do which is gonna be a problem i know it's gonna be one big problem it's already becoming a problem but maybe in one of the future sessions sahana will come back and be like my learning okay that was fun i think you should google eisenhower matrix uh, i use the eisenhower matrix like i used to use it at least now i just do whatever i mean that's the easiest way for you to not get overwhelmed just because mm-hmm. At the end of the day, everything seems important, but is it actually important? Mm-hmm. That's just maybe divide your work in terms of how important is the work and can it work? Yeah. yeah, I'm just hoping that it's the first year, so it sets a precedent of how the next one should go. So I wouldn't have to do this. Like it would give them a general idea, you know, like this is what we, words, words can do a lot, but they have a visual representation now. I have micromanaged and I have given. Now they can take this and produce further content. I wouldn't have to. You're lying to yourself and everyone. But you're going to change anything that you do. No. All right. I guess I'll share a learning. I am starting to notice a very big shift. When we initially started at the NLC, we we were highlighting the amount of funding that we were providing to uh, the cohorts. But I now have 170 meeting recordings where people have told me that funding is not the major thing that we're looking for. And what actually matters is the network that they'll be connected with. 
So that is a very shocking thing to me because when you go out and think about marketing, you know, all of these clickbaity titles, you think of all of these strategies of how to attract people. But when it comes down to the part of the thing where you actually want to put in time and work, and what do you actually need? You need people around who are doing similar stuff as you are and can help you out. But does the money, why does the money still attract people? Um, why do we go out and clickbaity titles? And funny enough, the newer ads that we are working on now, if you see them, you should see one of these ads that was done they launched, which is basically an NPM package we installed. And there was barely any mention of money. But when we look at the amount of meetings that we're getting right now, I think from Muskan's goals, you can see it was like around 44% uh, meeting bookings are coming in from our advertisements. So that's a big jump. And so the constant state of learning for us, man, is, is it the money that's attracting people? Is it the tips that are attracting people? Or is it, what is the actual value for proposition that people want to get out of this? Um, As you mentioned, I've seen. Yeah, we, we got it. So <laughs> we good got target. a bunch of them. So good job. Yeah. Like every few scrolls, I would see and be like, but I'm already here, guys. It's okay. The ad campaign is very cool. Thank you. We're trying to remove people who have already registered. Yeah, thank you. Getting their your email addresses and adding them as a list would be much better because uh, the pixel tracking at Facebook is not really good. And if you have some like ad blockers installed, uh, you won't like they won't be able to track pixel at all. So <laughs> it's really difficult. But I'm like, yeah, that's like my biggest fear to just show people ad that uh, have already seen multiple times or have already registered. So yeah, we have spent a lot of money there. <laughs> How much is it costing you guys? Uh, if I can ask. Yeah. Actually included everything in my goals. Yeah, see, it's basically cost per impression is almost good. But if we see meeting conducted, so yeah, it's like around twenty five Singapore dollars per meeting. Yeah. Okay. It got only two register two successful applicants for cohort two. So yeah, that's that's quite expensive as well. So like seven hundred Singapore dollar per applicant. Yeah, that is pretty expensive. Like yeah. how how did yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's only been it's only been two weeks since we've started running the ads. So only now we're starting to see good quality of applicants. So much is that this number will go down in the next few weeks. The chat, we yeah. just read it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. I would say if you think you need to hire better people, do that. Because I can imagine that this will go, this is going to cause a burnout to you, Sana, really quickly. So try to yeah. like people more and yeah. It, get people who can it's, just get things yeah it's not just about their skill level it's more of their comprehension level right like they could be very good at what they do say it's photo design or video design or real editing or anything like that they could be very good at what they do but only when it's their vision so unless they're able to completely comprehend what trying to tell them no matter how good they are they won't produce what you want essentially and I guess for that, again, repeated hiring circles, but finding that right match between good comprehension and good skill is such a headache. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe try doing some different feedback approaches. So I know when I first came to contact out, I like, I was like, like way junior had no design, like I had some design knowledge, but not at this kind of level. So my manager, Joseph, you have met, obviously he really uh, provided really good feedback to me and uh, really coached me on how to improve. Yeah, now like I'm like really good and he doesn't have to like even check back on months on and to see what I've been working on and I can just ship directly to production as well. So yeah, so maybe just try um, good feedback cycles, try to coach them on like how you can uh, improve, try to give them some resources as well. So I'm sure they will appreciate as well and that will help you like manage your workload better. Yeah, it's the resistance of Five minutes to do the work yourself and one hour to give them the proper feedback and fix the issue. Uh -huh. So this is dealing with it. Yeah. I've been doing some great work last week as well. She's conducted some calls learning about deep tech, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, I've been um, trying to get an uh, interview with mostly uh, from, from the y y YC deep tech uh, founders. So... Try also, this is improvement cycle. I, I tried to, it's like a try and error. So I tried to approach them like all via LinkedIn. I and send out the LinkedIn connection request and try to see 
if they are willing to hop on a call with us. So what we are trying to do here is we're trying to get more and more of these deep tech founders to share their own experience and share their own, own story with us. Especially we would like to know, because what we are trying to do here is experimental project. If we don't have, for, for say, for a student like lacking off, backing off an institution, like academic institution, if I want to get into a deep tech a company, I want to found a deep tech company, how would they do the approach? And if there are actually these founders out there, right, like who really self-study and become an expert into the industry and really found their own company. And turns out actually there are a bunch of these founders out there and they are really ha happy and willing to share their own experience for free. Actually, most likely what they're trying to do here is they are passionate about it, given they are really not on the privilege to get into a decent uni or, or school backing before they start the com company. They still read a lot of papers, for example, like read a lot of papers on Google Scholar. And also get into a lot of communities and, and see uh, what's the current trending or most cited uh, paper. Um, for, for example, top 100 cited papers, um, they would take a look at it. And I think the most important thing is some, the same as Senos, they start their own company with, from their personal experience that they already suffer from this issue and tackle from this problem for quite some time. So that's why they want to start their own business. But for those who don't, they would usually get uh, some mentors and advisors uh, before to deal with the problem so that they understand uh, what's happening out there and um, uh, what's been like the challenges and um, difficulties uh, in the industry um, that uh, people are trying to solve, uh, but uh, th the niche market. And also if once they un understand the problem, I think the next thing that they are trying to do is like into, yeah, same thing, get your MVP ready and try to talk to users and see if they can come the product. Yeah, so this is kind of something that we've been uh, talking to um, all the deep tech founders and what they've been, you know, telling us uh, about their own journey and experience a lot. And I think on top of it, interesting though, one thing I found out, a lot of founders who, without uh, backing of the academic institution, they usually get a <laughs> co-founder who get uh, usually got the PhD degree in the related industry who will really tackle on the hands-on technique while the other one will tackle on the trying to discover the, uh, validate the idea, discover the problem, talk to the users. So it's like a pair of one, one people work on the technique, one people do the extrovert thingy. Yeah. Talk to BC, talk to users, etc. So yeah, it's how the chemistry works here. So hopefully it works also the same for all of you guys. <laughs> Because of the like credibility, right? Maybe that's why they want to work with someone with a PhD. It just it's like it. having a single person R and D department. Of course, yeah. they don't want to work. So, yeah. right? like in an initial stage, you can't get an R and D team. But if you have someone who has already put their time into researching that mm -hmm. field, it makes a lot of. It is a very sustainable choice for them to take them into the company, and it's it's basically a one person army that manages an entire R&D team. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, and, and also uh, to add on top of it, some of them who are really fond of the industry and really want to tackle the issue and the problems. Actually, one of the guys, he even, in order to, he's trying to discover a new materials for his nano system, like an iron patch or something. So it's a new thingy. No one's worked on it. He tried to set up his own lab in his house with an IKEA table. So it's like an interesting story, it's it just, but then he just self-study everything himself. Whatever they're stuck with the, for example, they don't un quite understand the papers. They just ask ChatGPT, <laughs> and then just they get their overall idea on what is it about it. And also if uh, they're really stuck on the, uh, uh, the idea or the theory, the article issue, they ask for mentors, they ask for advisors. And throughout the way, you know, know more about the trend and industry and also you understand the problem a little bit better. Yeah. All right. You guys, touch. if you guys share your goals, would you guys be able to share your goal? Or like in the chat, yeah. we were supposed to do that before today's meeting. All right. It's put up reminders. Okay. We'll put up reminders on Discord for everybody to like. Or Discord. Uh, what's up? The, the main problem with our Discord being less accessible to listen, actually, it was. You're voting him back to him. 
can how uh, wait no so it's... i actually want to get this because then if if it doesn't work out then we'll scrap discord all together and just move to whatsapp no the channel structure is good but if you're going to send a reminder to do something on discord i think whatsapp would be a better option right for the reminder because having the channels and having it stay so properly on record is much preferred to having one whatsapp chat where everything is done and having different groups and communities also sounds like much faster so the discord structure works for the information itself and what we do there and the benefit of keeping discord is you get to have the history right yeah. but when you add people yeah the even if people still see come the in they can see the ones before it and that doesn't work because they break but uh, if there's a reminder to do something i think whatsapp is a more active choice even the other cohort members any time we've talked to them they have been much faster to respond on whatsapp mm-hmm. than on this I'm pretty sure some of the friend requests are still pending, yeah. and we've organized entire meetings with them for once. I think right. if you send them, this would be a better choice. Also, um, rich people may not want to join the board just because of money, right? They have other um, objectives, and I think even in our call when we first, when you first interviewed us, I mentioned the same thing. It's not money that we're after, but the thing is, if you guys weren't putting up money. we wouldn't have joined because that gave some sort of credibility it's not because we want the money but rather the fact that if it wasn't then at some point we'd expect you to ask for money if that makes sense it was much more upfront yeah though. it it gave a little bit more credibility because if someone's offering you so much stuff you will just keep one key yeah. he would give you out of yeah things. exactly and all that so the entire thing about the equity and everything being upfront Even though it isn't the primary goal for most people, I think it was a very valuable point in the entire discussion. So, you know, first talk to us. Yep, definitely makes sense. I guess it plays some sort of a role, so that money component has to be there for people to know that there is a money component associated with this. But the actual value that you get from everything that I've heard from all of these founders is not coming from that route. Have okay. you guys considered tying up with incubators or something? Of, sorry, just uni incubators. It gives you access to a ton of students. And yeah, I guess I've reached out to two hundred odd universities, and none of them have replied. The next thing I'm gonna do now is reach out to job boards. So incubators from university haven't replied. Head of department haven't replied. I reached out to some I don't know dean or director or some or from some college like. My next thing is just gonna be reaching out to their job departments because at least that way they'll promote me to their students. But like my thought to that is they'll probably ask me for money to advertise. Yeah, I think that's the only thing you run into, right? Because all of these incubators just wanna wonder what's in it for me. Right? That's what they ask. I mean, but it's it's not a problem because we're already running like ads of like Muskan XP. We're already paying seven hundred SGD for one uh, successful candidate. So to speak, on those terms, no college is going to charge us seven hundred. We get marketed to all of that too. The yeah, the student job. ambassador at the incubation center here, and they are relatively new, but they're like out of all of the reality ambassador, the most, and they're just new, so they're still getting the footing. They're still trying to filter through startups and things like that. So if you want, you could try, or if you want me to relay a message to them, you could let me know. I can definitely spread the word as much as you can. We want. I don't remember if I mentioned this to you in your introductory meeting or not, but but I don't know if I mentioned it in the last week. We want to eventually move to in-person events. Right? So yeah. if you do tell me, uh, people in your city and you share it with incubators and stuff, it would help us get there faster. And probably you have more founders in your in your vicinity to interact with. So. Do that, sure, definitely. If you have access yeah. to that incubator center or the person in charge, get them to spread the word. Ask all the people you know to join. One of the things to note is they very like heavily prioritize hardware based startups. They right? are uh, they are like I mean, not I mean, very. Not... You guys mentioned on your website that you prefer like tech students to join you so that people so that they can build their own SaaS bootstrap. So necessary. So when we say that, we mean it, by that's not a hard requirement. What we mean by that is just it's easier for a software engineer to handle technical aspects of building startup as compared to someone who does not have those skills. So right. 
if you are still an entrepreneur but you don't do technical stuff uh you are still welcome as long as you can you can come in here and find technical co-founder and come with your team of extended co-founders or just like developers etc there's no cap on that you're saying something like about damn it this is the second time this is happening this quite I accidentally, so I've been talking to this new a friend of mine who has recently started his own company and I have been trying to get him to join Athena but he's just stuck on the funding saying it's not good enough for my company yet and I think I did mention them last time these friends of mine who partnered with Upgrad and their startup uh, yeah, I think I mentioned them so I've been trying to convince the founders to join And we were in a very heated argument right before this call. So I accidentally opened Telegram and got this black, uh, which is why I forgot what I was doing. Sorry, how much are they looking for funding? So he shared another program with me. He would not enjoy the program, but he would be was funding down. Just search that up. be on ideation stage in Australia. So it's founder.university, um, the three course that teaches you how to build an MVP and get your first users. Now they say that they invest 25k or 125k. So that's very big, just an online program. So they say our founder university standard investment is 25k for 2.5%. Or one one twenty for seven percent. Okay. Who we invest in thirty to forty something per cohort, and the program costs five hundred dollars. Oh, what? No. Okay, interesting. Always take investment details with with under care, cause they always have some flaws under them, right? Nobody right. like handing you out money to go build stuff, cause I don't know if I hand out my money would you and build it or you would disappear. Is it- So all of all of these programs have sub clauses that you should definitely look into before you funding. I haven't like we were in a heated argument and I had to cut off saying I haven't gone through the program that you're mentioning. Let me put in the sub clause and I'll make you with an argument. But yeah, so it's difficult. But one twenty five k for seven percent when you're at ideation stage, uh, it should be very doubtful any VC is going to give you that kind of money. Athena's uh, funding. Right? When is it? How is the timeline? You mentioned after the third month, either like we give up equity and you either choose to invest or not invest. Right? Is that like investing at the third month, or would it be later down the line? Okay. It can it can potentially go on till the end of it if you like. We'll start at the start of the fourth month to talk about investment, but. We also have a network of seven hundred plus VCs. I'm not sure if I showed you there when we conducted an introductory meet. Did I have a presentation? No, there was a. Okay, now I have a presentation. Okay, Wait, let me bring it up. It brings so much legitimacy to things. Okay, so now I go over this when I meet to people. So yeah, so talk about Rob. I explain that Rob is a limited partner at multiple VC firms, right? If you have Um, research about it. You would have heard about us. We find like creative black code, etc. So behind that, there is a network of seven hundred plus investors to fund those who we think are worth. So your funding does not have to stop if you decide to take funding. You will not have to stop at five to ten or like the base minimum amount to do. Build a business. If you're looking for hyperscale, you would also require hyper uh, like funding really fast. And in those situations, you connect up the VCs that you need to talk to. And if your pitch is good enough, if your product is successful enough, if your market is what's invested, you got the deal. Ideally, what are you looking for at the, what would a VC look for as well? Right at that point, MVP or post client, the shark tank level where you have a lot of clients and revenue as well. It all depends. Uh, another point from the argument that I was just having. So there are two types of investments, right? There is just about when the call. So there are two. Okay, this is what happens when you start work at six a.m. It's even worse for Siren because she is hours ahead of us. Uh, right, nine thirty. It's almost been thirteen hours since I've been working, and for uh, Siren, it's seventeen. I have another call thirty minutes later. 
Well, uh, uh, it's bad. Yeah, so what was I saying? Another point from the argument, which is that two types of investments you can either be a VC firm or like a private equity investor. Private equity investors generally come at a later point in stage because they don't require risk. They just mm-hmm. want to say, hey, I want to put in my money, I want turns out of this. Whereas VC firms take pets on early stage, mid stage startups, right? When you talk about VC firms, they bet more on the founder and the idea as compared to everything else. So if you have an idea and if you have, sorry, if you're a good founder and if you have somewhat of an idea, he can bet on you or like anything, he can bet on you on the point that, okay, they'll build something that will make profit and does not need to be exponentially high profit, profit. But like when you think of it from all the stuff that Rob talks about or all the right. extravagant businesses out there with like 100 billion uh, in valuation and stuff, those co- come from the and ex- ideas. And if to get to that level, it's certain that you need to raise funds. So you would, now you, it's all a call of how it's actually, it can't be put down into a couple of points. Depends on how you are start working out, how the progress is making. Are people giving you money? Is your how do your sales number look? How government number look? No, no. So when you take all of that into consideration, it changes from do you are you looking for hyper growth, which is just I want to go take for example this company called Deal. They're the fastest growing startup um, ever, and they have so much money. Um, and the, I think they're also the fastest unicorns, uh, but yeah, so, and they did everything in a span of one year, less than that, mm-hmm. less than that. But there are companies who are struggling even after being alive for 10 years. And, and I'll give you an example. This friend who I'm working for, who I'm arguing with is used to work for a company called Pan, which was a competitor of Deal, right? Both of them did the same, both Deal and Panther did the same work. Panther does not exist anymore. They could not raise enough funding. Every time their business tanked, the founder had to go out, seek funding, come back, pay salaries, try to keep their businesses of business afloat. Eventually, the founder gave up saying, hey, I can't keep going for multiple rounds of funding just to keep my company alive. We're not seeing any profitability. So they had to kill it. Now, it's a very stark difference, right? Because in the same time period, Another company who's doing the exact same work I am doing is being coined as the fastest growing startup and the fastest like unicorn ever. So how am I feeling so bad? Something like must be different there. In those cases, everything becomes subjective. There is no written steps that both of these could have followed to grow at the same pace that they did. Well, okay. One last question before we near almost seven days. One last question. In terms of the funding rate, we're almost at the stage where we're reaching out to clients, right? We're about to start. And what we'd like is we'd like funding or access to investors right about now because it would help us quickly scale and out- reach a lot of people. And we're happy to issue Athena the equity beforehand if required, right? If that's what it takes. Uh, we really like access to that because we've shown that we're serious as well because we incorporated three months before joining Athena. And we've, we've been working on it nonstop. So we'd like access to that network and we're happy to issue Athena early on itself, just in some waiting till. And if that's something that you guys would consider, we'd be happy to look into it. And the thing is like, we're just trying to weigh all the VCs. Right now I have, I think in the debate, there's one VC who's sitting at one crore right now. And there's another who's sitting at three crores. They haven't told me what they want. They just said that much is what. That's the maximum risk they're willing to take with us at least. And then there's my college incubator who is giving me like what one or two lakhs is what they were willing to go to. So it's we'll be happy to look into maybe another call if required. We can get into more details for all right. So I think one crore is like one twenty five K only. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think that's for one twenty five one. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's in tech. You should talk to them further in terms of what amount of equity state they want. And if you want to access that with us, I'd bring this up with Rob. We discuss this internally and get back to you. Maybe you can drop a message on, say, John River somewhere. Just tagging Rob, saying, tagging Rob, or saying, and we discuss this specific thing. Stating your your exact answer, right? Because if that's the way, it's if that's the goal you want to next for your startup, which is to get them partly and proceed forward. 
you okay. should like take a chance as long as getting to talk to some person who has access to a bunch of investors. Cool. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, we'll talk about it internally as well, but like you should put it out on Discord or like maybe WhatsApp or wherever you're comfortable. Put it out as well so that you can have a group conversation at all. Yeah, perfect. All right. Cool. All right, guys. Any other things you want to talk about? Thank you for it. Yeah, all yeah because because if you said because if you said I would be like posted on this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. See you guys in the next.